the interaction with local communities can be central to the success or failure of projects. We talked to Glyn Cochran, one of the architects of modern community relations in the extractive industries. Glyn, welcome to Raw Talks. Thank you, Nick. Glyn, you just published your latest book, Anthropology in the Mining Industry, Community Relations After Bougainville's Civil War. Tell me, why did you pick that milestone? What changed in the industry with Bougainville? I chose Bougainville because I, th I thought, and I still think, that it represented an important watershed in, for community relations in extractive industry. So that everybody understands what the issue is, um, can you tell us what happened in Bougainville? In the late 1980s, the community around the mine closed the mine down unilaterally. And as a result of that, the whole relationship between the island of Bougainville and the state of Papua New Guinea degenerated, and we had civil war, which cost a great number of lives, and that lasted for several years. Bougainville was a tragedy, but it had many of the things that are now associated with a successful operation. How is it, that? Well, it had a legal agreement. It had guidance for local economic development, community development. It had an excellent technical training scheme, and it had generous payments. And yet, when the tragedy occurred, the company was caught completely by surprise. As a consequence of that experience, they began to say to themselves, look, we really need to train people who are going to tell us what is really happening in communities in case we have these nasty surprises again. That went on for about 10 years, full speed, a lot of excellent work done, skills built, knowledge foundation laid, very good. At the same time that the international agencies were looking at what they needed to do to be quite convinced that extractive industry was behaving well in the community. They developed a reporting regime, things like the Global Compact, GRI, human rights reporting, all those things. Now, my sense is that that has gone too far and that it's involved three costs which really ought to be considered unacceptable. The first of those costs is the fact that millions are being spent on silly tick box reporting, which doesn't really capture the essence of the problem or what might be done about it. All that information is going to organizations which quite simply don't have the skills to process it or do anything about it. The second cost, I think, is the fact that the extractive industry noticed that if they actually went along with these agencies and ticked all their boxes, they got a good grade. When they got a good grade, they began to say to themselves, well, you know, we don't really have to do the hard yards in the community any longer. We're getting a pass. So what did they do? They have stopped building community skills of a specialized nature, and they are instead developing media skills to tick the boxes. And community relations is now becoming a media relations event between the companies and their international inquisitors. And I don't think that that's going to end well. It is not always clear whether central governments truly represent communities. Are there circumstances where companies should negotiate directly with local communities? Yes, I think there are. Uh, some of those are mandated by law, as you probably know, in places like Papua New Guinea. Uh, you have to have the community present. Uh, that has been the case in the Philippines also until recently. And as you know much better than I, in a large number of Latin American countries where they have a comarca and special recognition for indigenous people, they must be included in that sense. But I think it's probably important to make a distinction between negotiation and consultation. I think one must always consult with communities all the way from opening to closing. And consultation is not negotiation. First of all, for consultation, we have to know quite precisely in the community who is it that is entitled to make decisions. And how do we know when we have a valid community decision? In many instances, we're not talking about the Westminster focus system. We're talking about completely different ways of behaving. Those need to be understood and built into this whole process. 
And there are circumstances where the uh, investor get uh, caught in between uh, these, the different levels of uh, administration. Uh, what what happened in those situations? They have to get on with the business of building trust and good relationships. And they have to leave to others the question of the final deal. Let's talk about the, um, this principle of um, free prior and informed consent by indigenous uh, peoples. In general, it's been well received by the civil society and looked at with some suspicion from uh, investors. Uh, but more generally, should um, local communities have veto on projects? I'm not sure that I would characterize it as a veto. I think what's be often being said is, let's get to know each other, let's establish some trust, and then we can see whether or not we like the deal that you're offering. There have been numerous instances, quite recently in Australia, where vetoes have been overcome because the relationship has been built and trust has been established. I don't think it's necessarily the case that it always leads to a veto at local government level or at local community level. I don't think so. I think really it's a quite sensible precaution and I think it should be respected because it is something that has come from indigenous communities themselves. Is it about convincing them or is it about negotiating with them? I think it's something uh, about convincing. Negotiating is always a rather difficult thing when you talk to mining companies, because every time I used to say, well, you know, then we get to negotiation, their eyes would light up and you'll think that's where we win. Would you describe the best uh, form of relationship as uh, neighbors or um, commercial partners? I think the first thing that you've got to do is to try and slowly and patiently build relationships that are characterized by mutual trust, mutual respect, and mutual understanding. When that has been done, it becomes easier to do other things. But I think what we call the relationship should be suggested by the facts on the ground, not by companies wishing to portray their relationship with communities in a way that will be understood by third parties. The most important parties to the relationship are the community and the company itself. But there are periods uh, during the life of a project that require hard negotiation. Absolutely. And you will get it. <laughs> and we've had it. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But you know, I don't think you can characterize it completely uh, as one of neighborliness or one of commercial intent. I think that it will grow, it will evolve. What it does require is a constant surveillance. I think it absolutely essential to remember that mining accelerates the speed of social change. And it is the obligation of a company to understand the trajectory of that change so that they can avoid harm and benefit from goodwill. There are circumstances where companies offer to pay the legal fees to communities. Um, is that best practice? I think it's very good practice. Uh, you know, in the arrangements that, uh, that I recommended some years ago, uh, we had several stages of understanding the community, understanding consultation, and understanding what was needed. But I always made the point, and I would still make the point, that I think it absolutely essential that that is a two-way understanding process. We have many situations where the communities don't just need lawyers to help them to sign things, they also need to understand the company and the process of mining. And I think that kind of assistance makes a great deal of sense and will make for a much better relationship. But it's very seldom the case that people are asking themselves, how well does that community understand the company? Not only, it's only half the question to ask, how well does the company understand the community? One specific uh, issue, but I think it's quite interesting, some, some communities are um, still today not monetized. And when you get projects going to those communities, they introduce cash with, with the practice of doing business. Um, how should companies deal with that? Money is factative, it's uh, divisible, it can be multiplied and divided. But something like community well-being and community goodwill is indivisible. You can't, you can't do it. So what has seemed to make sense to some companies has been to provide benefits which are communal rather than benefits which are completely individual. How does that work? Well, 
if you give uh, if you give irrigation or if you give a school or you give a health clinic that can be enjoyed by a community mm -hmm. But as soon as you begin to give the royalty payments, then individuals be can begin to appropriate those funds for themselves, and the community as a whole doesn't get a very great deal. And is there not a risk that companies uh, end up doing things that belong to government? I think what you will tend to find is that uh, more and more it is the case that we are operating in areas where government services are of recent provenance. And whether you like it or not, you get dragged into things that you probably wouldn't like to do. The trick is to work out how you're going to get out of them at the same time as you're getting into them. Because most governments, once they find you're going to pay some of their bills, they don't necessarily rush to take, to take up the slack. Is the ability to uh, establish um, successful relationships with the community a competitive advantage for companies? Obviously, I'm going to say yes, <laughs> it is. But let me give you some reasons for this. I think if you look at extractive industry, the amount of time that it, is, that it now takes to finance, insure, regulate, and get on with the business has increased by three or four, sometimes five times in the last 10 to 15 years. That means that the more time you can save, the more money you can save. And good community relations can cut through a great deal of that delay. So that's one obvious advantage. Secondly, I would say, you know, if you look at the kinds of people that work for extractive industry, they like to work for companies that take these issues seriously. They want to work for a company that really is interested in helping the community. And I don't think that it... Uh, I think that is an advantage, yes. And the other thing is that you will discover that if you have a good reputation and take these issues seriously, then new opportunities are presented to you for investment. People don't want a company that brings trouble. They want a company that they know they can trust to develop this in a way that will not cause undue friction. Do you feel that nowadays the com community relation questions are central to a strategy or, or, or remain an afterthought? I think they're fairly central to a strategy, but I sometimes wonder whether they are an afterthought. After all, you know, you find companies issuing the most purple prose about what they feel about poor communities around the world, but yet you'll discover that outside their headquarter, they don't have any contact at all with communities. <laughs> it's just those communities that are near their operations. I don't think you can cherry pick social responsibilities. You either deal with them altogether or you don't deal with them at all. I saw a recent instance of Qantas in Australia, which I found was very interesting, where the, the Qantas was, was passing on advice to the Australian government, which was getting very upset and telling them, you're, you're, uh, you're an airline, why don't you just stick to airline business and not tell us? And they said, look, we have to pass on to you what our, what our employees think. Glenn, we've been talking a little bit about responsibilities uh, mm. by the company, uh, but I've heard you said uh, several times, uh, use this concept of reciprocity. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I've always said that if we have community relations, they are basically social relations. And social relations have several features that are undeniable. They first of all ought to be voluntary, which means you're not going to be told what to do by anybody. Secondly, there is reciprocity. You give and you receive. Uh, I've often said that I simply cannot understand uh, the concept, for example, of corporate social responsibility, which details company responsibilities, but apparently the company has got no rights. Now, if you take the legal fiction of a corporation, companies have got rights as well as responsibilities. I've often thought a lot of the social thinking that we're exposed to is rather primitive. Is community relations an art? or a science. <laughs> can you engineer community relations? I don't believe you can. This question that you just asked me is one I used to be asked very frequently when I first got to extractive industry. And I used to reply to them, you know, well, um, you know, community relations is a bit like safety. Uh, you know, you can't engineer safety, but you want people to think it. Community issue is just the same. I mean, for example, can you engineer uh, an annual general meeting. Is that an art or a science? I've got no idea. 
But what I do know is that it is not right to sort of try and focus on the individual practitioner and ask what he or she is doing. Fact of the matter is that any company that wants to be successful today must ensure that everybody takes responsibility for community relations, not just some department or one or two individuals. Is that part of the cultural values? Absolutely, it has to be. I mean, how can you not have it be a core discipline mm. in the industry. It isn't an optional add-on. You know, we'll care for you when we have to. It's the way you do business. Or put it another way, it's the way you ought to be working. Over the last uh, 15 to 20 years, we've seen a plethora of uh, initiatives, uh, tools, manuals, um, you name them. Um, are we at risk of becoming too prescriptive? I suppose there's always a risk of that. Um, I have noticed the toolkit idea around for quite a while. Uh, you know, it's always reminded, the toolkit idea always reminds me of, uh, you know, the idea of having a garage where the owners haven't bothered to train any mechanics. <laughs> they just hand you the kit and tell you to get on with it. The issue here, I think, is one of is it a discipline? I think the toolkit idea represents a constant attempt by the industry to turn community relations into what we would call a standard operating procedure, an SOP, which can be applied to a routine technical task. These are not routine technical tasks. The problem with the manuals and the guidance and the toolkits are that they do not place proper emphasis on the fact that the people that we have working in this field today will be encountering situations we've never encountered before. The answer is not going to be in the book. The answer is to give them the confidence and the skills to come up with a solution to a previously unexperienced problem. Some of these tools we are talking about um, have been developed by corporations, mm. but some of them have also been developed and disseminated by multilateral agencies, mm. development mm. agencies. Uh, how do you see their role in, in, in this uh, universe of uh, community relations? The fact of the matter is that the international agencies have not got a very great deal of expertise at community level. They're, you know, as time has gone by, they're interested in bigger, bigger deals, big policy packages, big financing pa packages. This does not expose them to a regular familiarity with conditions at community level. The reason why they're listened to by extractive industry is because they give them a tick. They say, you're okay, and that's what the extractive industry wants. But I think it really is rather silly to expect that they can add value. I mean, even if you take the World Bank's mining division, I hate to tell you, but most of their community expertise came from the mining industry itself. It was not grown in Washington. And that's one of the great problems, is that the people who are doing all the reviewing and the judging and the assessing have a lack of the skills which they say they're well-placed to deal with. And Glyn, um, with that, I think we're going to come to the end of the uh, talk. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. And to keep up with the debate, follow us at rawtalks.org.